do that. So six. I'm not the not the time. Here's what it says: six o'clock. Uh, next Sunday. You know, next Sunday, Ross Beach is going to be here, and he has written a book. If, if you don't don't remember or not, haven't heard of it, "Dying to Live," and he's going to bring the book. He's going to he's going to have the service. He's going to sign the book, his book, and he wants to sell some of that book. So, so that'll be next Sunday here at here at the church. Ah. Uh, the 29th, which is two weeks from today, we will be lifting church here at Shavona. We're going to Bayshore Camp for the Gospel Music Convention and Sunday morning service. So we're lifting, we're lifting church here. We're going up there. Ten. It's ten o'clock up there too, I believe. Okay. Are there any other announcements? If not, be sure to remember the board meeting because we've got quite a few things, more things than we can do in an hour and a half probably, but we're going to work at it. Okay. At this point then, I think we're going to have Janet come and do some songs and then we'll go from there.
seated. This time, I want to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Douglas Suspansky. That close? Yeah, you're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a couple more tries. Try it again? Yeah, whatever. Right. I'm used to it. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I got a bit close the first time. Maybe I'll run a class on it. Uh, he's, he's a retired U.S. Army sergeant, Purple Heart recipient, and wounded veteran. He looks to share his story, his tragedy through our triumph story, wherever he can. In fact, Douglas shared his story with us at Shimona last year. Doug is a graduate of Liberty University and Rawlings School of Divinity with a Master of Religion and Theology degree. Doug resides in Main City with his wife and four children. And I think that's about all I got. So at this time, let's give Doug a good round of applause. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. It is an honor to be here once again. Um, before we begin, Arthur asked me to see if there are any prayers or concerns. I know this is uh, what your pastor does um, every week. Are there any prayers or concerns that we can pray about? Does anybody have anything? Don't all raise your hand at once. <laughs> yes. Mm. That that one hits home uh, for me quite quite well. Uh, having many friends who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, hearing that news, that's definitely. Uh, I know in my own life, um, last week, probably three days ago, maybe give or take, one of my childhood church friends uh, walked into the hospital sick and ended up passing away within 24 hours, completely unexpected. So for my own self. We're going to lift up that family to you as well. Is there anything else? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that is an amazing praise of Lord. Kids are a blessing from the Lord. Although there has been a few times lately that I'm like, why did I have four? Someone should have warned me. Now, if, if they're listening or watching today, I love them all. They're a huge blessing. Um, but yeah, kids are a blessing. Um, anything else? We lift up Rob Smith again. Uh, Rob is here. Okay. He, he still has a procedure coming up. All right. Well, we'll definitely lift up Rob in Afghanistan. Anything else? All right, let's, let's pray then. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we're able to come together as your people to hear the word that you are going to speak through me. I pray that it would touch my heart and each and every one of us here. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We lift up Rob. We pray that you'd bring him to fullness of health, bring him comfort and peace and restoration. We also lift up the situation in Afghanistan right now, Lord, as that's just something that uh, touches me deeply and touches all of America. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with all veterans of Afghanistan who are dealing with just anxiety and PTSD and wondering whether their time there was, was worth the sacrifice. And I pray you just reassure them with comfort and peace. Lord, for the people of Afghanistan who are fleeing, I pray that America would have the, the fortitude and resolve to make sure that they are safe and protected, to not abandon them. I pray that you'd send your angels around them and protect the Afghani people all the refugees and, and keep their children safe and their families safe and thwart the plans of the Taliban. Lord God, we pray for your blessing upon this time and this service. In Jesus' name, amen. So as Arthur pointed out, um, I am a, my name is Douglas Shapansky Jr. I'm a medically retired U.S. Army combat veteran and Purple Heart recipient who was wounded by a suicide car bomber in 2005, and last year I came and shared my story, and everyone was extremely welcoming. Uh, you were very supportive. Thank you for those who bought hats, shirts, mugs, um, shook my hand. 
that's the type of thing that encourages me to continue on with the call that God has on my life. And if you don't know this, a lot of parachurch ministries like the one that I do my primary job with suffered a lot during the pandemic with canceled speaking engagements and donations went down. And all churches were affected, don't get me wrong. But when you guys invited me here and Dan allowed me to speak, uh, that was a huge blessing. So thank you for that. Um, all those, every opportunity is a blessing from the Lord. Before we begin, though, I thought it customary as now your pastor, my brother-in-law, has joined the Air Force Air National Guard. If you don't know this, and I'm sure you might, we have a thing in the Army where we kind of like to make fun of the Air Force. It's kind of a thing that we do. And I already informed Dan of this, so he, not this is what I'm going to do, but the fact that he's going to get made fun of. I just wanted you to know that I found a picture of Dan at Air Force National Guard drill, and I'm going to show it to you right now. That's, that's Dan on a little plane. <laughs> okay, but that, of course, is a joke, and, um, you know, the planes are much bigger. Dan has joined the Air Force Air National Guard, and I can tell you this much, it truly is an honorable thing. It's an honorable thing to serve your country, and even more so, it is an honorable thing, and more importantly, to serve God. He gets to be able to do both, here and there. And so all joking aside, you know, you may, if, if I preach again, or if, even today it might happen again, Air Force jokes, they just come naturally for us Army guys, okay? The only one we make fun of more is the Coast Guard, and really, we don't even consider them always the military. But that's a different story. That's a different story, Okay. And we can do that because we're all in the service together, and it's all out of good fun. But today's message, though, is something a little bit more serious. It's titled, my sermon is titled, In Every Way Proclaim the Gospel Unceasingly. And today's scriptural passage is Philippians 1, 12 to 18. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain something to you. Last year, I finished up my graduate degree, and one of the assignments was we had to write about Philippians 1, 12 to 18. And we wrote this whole thing, and then I, I didn't have a chance to preach it. And then God opened this opportunity up, and I said, you know what? This is the time for this message right now. Because right now is when we need the gospel the most. See, imagine... You are lying in a bed with, with the uh, machines beeping around you, with a sterile room. You're gasping for breath. Your body begins to shiver. You have aches. You cannot breathe. You cough and you spit. It's a nightmare. It's painful. Everyone all around you is struggling to breathe. You are sick. They are sick. You wonder, how will I get better? Who has a cure? Who will help me? Who will bring me a good report. You hope with all your hope that someone will bring you good news. See, with the COVID-19 pandemic, for some this is a, a reality. In fact, in May of this year, I lost my own grandpa to it. But there is an even greater pandemic that is ravaging the world right now, and that is sin. That's sin. With the recent pandemic affecting our country, though, how do public officials and doctors and scientists get out the information to us? How do they do it? They have briefings. They post on social media. They tell us through different opportunities. They meet with people. Now, you might not always agree with the information, and let's not go down that rabbit trail because there's a lot that I don't agree with. But the fact of the matter is, when there is something important to convey, when there are news that people need to hear, even the government gets out there and they start, they start putting on blast all this stuff. They start sharing news briefings and having press conferences and getting this life-saving news to as many people as possible. See, Christians, we also have some very important and life-saving news that the public that our neighbors, that our friends, that our co-workers, that our family members need to hear. 
That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Raise your hand if you know what the gospel is, and everyone should. I mean, let's, okay, you didn't raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ who died for our forgiveness to give us eternal life and that those who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is the gospel. The gospel news that we carry. Christians, as important as it is to protect and prolong our physical life here on earth, how much more important is it to tell people about the eternal life that we have in Christ? Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, you're like, well, this is going to be a 10-step, like, how to share the gospel, or like, let's go door to door. No, that's not what this is about today. This is a call to arms. This is a call to proclaim So let me take you back a few thousand years. Because you know who else knew about the power of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul. Who knows who the Apostle Paul is? Road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, all right? If you didn't know who the Apostle Paul is, well, guess what? We're going we're gonna to go there a little bit, okay? Let me take you back to the time when the Roman Empire ruled the world. A time when everything was written on parchment by candlelit. A time when it was carried by courier. A time when a follower of Christ could be jailed, imprisoned, beaten, tortured for the gospel of Jesus Christ. A time not unlike our own. I don't know if you've heard of any of the reports, but even in Canada, pastors are being imprisoned for their faith. Congregations are being scattered in the name of public health. Now, whether you agree or disagree with health officials or, or health measures, public safety measures, the fact of the matter is, across the world, and even as close as Canada, the gospel is being squashed, and pastors and congregations are being persecuted. It's happening right next door. See, we see a letter being written by one of the men, Paul, addressed to the saints in Philip. Philippi, excuse me, in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. What did it say? Let's take a look at Philippians 1, 12 to 18. Philippians 12, 1, 12 says this. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. See, Paul had already addressed the Philippians. He had given them some encouragement. He said that I'm praying for you at the beginning of chapter 1. He was, he was very encouraged about how they had continued the gospel mission. Now, he's in jail. And I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I often looked at this passage, and it, it left me a little bit perplexed. You know, because you, you read it, and you're going, okay, they're talking about motives, they're talking about him being an affliction. And when you really begin to look at this passage, there's a lot more to it. In the context of Philippians 1, 12 to 18, Paul is exhorting the Philippian brethren to preach the gospel unceasingly in every way possible. Here's Paul, a former Pharisee, a Hebrew, a persecutor of the church, now a slave to Christ, a bondservant, as it says, in jail alongside of Timothy. And he's telling everyone else, he's telling all the rest of the the brethren in Philippi, it's time to proclaim the gospel. How many people in prison, if you were in prison right now, you'd be you think about pray, proclaiming the gospel. 
right? Our natural inclination is not to do that. We'd be, we'd be thinking, wow, the food's not that good here. Why am I in jail? I got to watch my show. Now I can't go do anything. I mean, we might be thinking a thousand other things in the flesh. But Paul, he's thinking about making the gospel known. And you're wondering, well, what kind of groups did he face? What opposition did he face? There were a number of groups of opposition that the faithful Philippi brethren faced. The Roman guard, the envious and selfish and conflict-causing preachers, the dogs, the evil workers, the false circumcision, and the enemies of the cross of Christ, as Paul writes. Paul and the Philippian saints faced many forms of opposition. Do you know of any forms of opposition that the church is facing right now? We already talk, talked about one of them. Out of control officials taking down pastors and congregations. What about the enemy working in other ways like abortion? The gospel and the word of God being thwarted and manipulated everywhere we go. Morals falling out. Kids being taught to live sinful lifestyles. The church and the gospel is facing opposition at an unprecedented rate. But yet, we still have a call. So the three primary ways in this passage that Christians are exhorted to proclaim the gospel unceasingly. And the first is this. That Christians are to proclaim the gospel with a godly attitude by faithfully sharing, the, sharing Christ while enduring negative circumstances and trusting that God will transform them for the greater good of the gospel. Now, for those who've heard my testimony, that's one thing that the Lord did in my life. After I was wounded, I was able to overcome and endure because of Jesus. That's not just for me, it's for every single one of us. And as you know from my testimony, we will all go through trials and, and all endure negative circumstances. In fact, isn't the world right now enduring a giant negative circumstance that's continued to go on? 16 months? They're talking about lockdowns and masks and mandates and there's people on both sides of the aisle. The second is this. Christians can proclaim the gospel unceasingly by being obedient. That word is loaded. Probably everybody in here, when I said obedience, you're like, mm, 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 right? Because our natural inclination in the flesh is to be like, like a little child, and we don't want to obey, right? I mean, I'd raise your hand if it doesn't matter how old you are, you still have issues obeying sometimes, because I think we all do. And if you don't, you're probably fibbing a little bit, all right? Christians are to proclaim the gospel unceasingly by being obedient to share Jesus without regard for motive, trusting in the sovereign power of God to make Christ known using all preachers. Third, Christians can proclaim the gospel unceasingly by sharing Christ Jesus in every way possible, everywhere, and in every circumstance. With your words, with your deeds, with your lives, with your witness. In Philippians 1, 12 to 18, that is what the Apostle Paul is continuing to exhort the Philippian brethren to do. We are to share this important information, this life-saving news, and we can be part of sharing this cure of the disease of sin by proclaiming the gospel unceasingly, by making Christ Jesus known to all. So let's take a look at that first way in a little bit more depth. Philippians 12, 14. This says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. See, Paul's imprisonment for the gospel was transformed into an opportunity to share the gospel. That means that if we proclaim the gospel unceasingly, God will sovereignly transform our circumstances to, to make the cause of Christ grow, to give an opportunity for the good news. Every one of us have been in bad circumstances. You may not be in jail, although if you are, that's fine. I mean, if there's, you know, if anyone's in here on furlough, you know, I'm praying for you. But everyone will go through bad circumstances. Everyone will have times where they are in a position like Paul. 
In the beginning of Philippians 1, Paul declares his affection to the Philippian brethren, brethren, excuse me, and now he's transitioning his focus away from that to update them. And he says something that's really quite profound. He says, this imprisonment has been a way to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of those pastors in Canada that got arrested, God used that to proclaim the gospel across America across Canada, across the world, because every news article that came out, every reporter that wrote on it, pointed to Jesus. Now, it doesn't matter where you are on the side of debates of public health of that issue, the gospel was being proclaimed. So even though that pastor was unjustly arrested, Jesus was being lifted up no matter what. Same thing here in Philippians. His circumstances have been a blessing for the advancement of the gospel mission overall. And just a reminder, what is the gospel mission? The Great Commission. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Going and making disciples by sharing the good news to all nations. See, Paul more importantly exclaims that he has been able through his imprisonment in Rome to share the good news and make the cause of Christ known. And everyone that he has come in contact with heard the gospel. His circumstances were used to share the gospel more effectively. This is the question I'm posing to you. Are your circumstances being used to share the gospel? Ask yourself that question. I know that the Lord has challenged me. This message I wrote last year, and God even challenged me. He said, well, Douglas, are you doing enough to share the gospel? Is your life reflecting that day-to-day at home, at work, in interactions with different people, whether you're playing on a sports team like I do, whether we're here at church. See, Paul proclaimed the gospel, was imprisoned for it, and then God and his sovereign power over all people transformed the circumstances into an opportunity to share the gospel. You might be thinking, though, is that how Paul understood his time in prison? What did those living in his culture think? According to New Testament scholar and author Craig Kinnear, Greek philosophers typically declared that neither imprisonment nor death mattered. Only one's attitude. Paul partly agrees with this view, but for different reasons. God's sovereign use of the hardship for his glory and the superiority of undistracted devotion to Jesus. There's two things in there. In essence, what, God, what Dr. Keener is, is highlighting about God in our circumstances is the fact that God is sovereign over all things, but that attitude matters. See, Paul could have wrote in there, oh man, I'm in prison again. Oh, this stinks. Like, I do not want to be here right now. This is not fun. He could have had a sour attitude. He could have been a stick in the mud. I mean, Let's be honest, if we were in prison right now, would we be joyful and cheery? Probably not right off the bat. We'd probably be a little irritated because I know there's been times even recently when I'm like, Lord, this is really irritating right now. Why do I got to go through this? Yet Paul's in prison and he's talking about, hey, I'm in prison right now. Um, The gospel's going forth and God's using it. Attitude and the sovereignty of God. He uses all people and circumstances for his purposes. Even people opposed to him and his plans. In this world that we're living in right now, that is something that we can hold on to strengthen our faith. Because doesn't everything seem a little bit out of control? Doesn't everything over the last year and a half, 16 to 18 months seem like, man, Lord, are you still sovereign? Are you still in control? Maybe God is calling us to check our attitude and say, I'm still in control. Continue to rely on the the joy of the Lord. Is God using your circumstances to proclaim the gospel? You might be wondering, though, where exactly was Paul imprisoned? And does that even matter? What people group did he gain an opportunity to share Christ with? It did matter. It does matter because any time God allows something to happen in our life or puts people in certain circumstances or places in the world, it's for a reason. Even when you go and, hmm, Secretary of State, what a place, right? God bless the people working there because they made me sign up for a time slot and then they had me stand in line, which makes no sense to me. 
I don't get that. Even when you go to the Secretary of State and you're upset, God has you there for a reason. There might be someone you talk to. There might be someone you can pray for. There might, your presence in that room just might bring the Holy Spirit because God's with you. So it is important to know that God places people in specific reasons and specific places, instances, circumstances for a reason. He proclaimed, he being Paul, Christ to a very influential group. Again, according to Dr. Keener, he proclaimed to the Praetorian Guard. Some scholars believe that this is Caesar's household. Literally, the Praetorium here refers to detention in Rome by the Praetorian Guard as in Acts 28.16, which is the centrality of Rome in the empire. God placed Paul in the center of Rome, in the, one of the most influential places he could be in, and, shared, and he was able to share the gospel with this group. Because of Paul's obedience in proclaiming Christ, making him known, even when his circumstances took a negative turn, God sovereignly transformed him into a greater opportunity to proclaim the gospel in the heart of Rome itself. That's a huge deal. Every time I share my testimony or I'm, I'm given the opportunity to preach, I think of it as a great opportunity from the Lord. The same thing with Paul. The same thing with all of you here. You'd think that these men would be upset and downtrodden. You'd think that they'd be annoyed. and No. They were proclaiming Christ powerfully and effectively. They were doing so, so well that the cause of Christ in verse 12 and 13 was not just known, was not just a little bit understood, not a little known, it was well known. Not slightly known, not barely known, well known. Paul did not write that a few people may have heard, the, heard of Christ. He wrote that everyone else, including the Praetorian Guard, which was made up of thousands of soldiers, elite men who protected prefects, which were governors, and the emperor himself. The gospel has to spread far and wide, and it can only happen through us. God also used Paul to encourage the faithful Philippi brethren. Upon hearing about what Paul did, they were encouraged. Whenever we proclaim the gospel with our lives, with our words, with our actions, wherever we're at, in whatever group we're among, it encourages other believers. You may think that your circle of influence and your sphere of influence is not that big. You may think, I'm retired, or I, have only, I work over here, or we're out in the country. I don't live in a city. But none of that matters to the Lord. God will use all people in every place that they're at in every circle of per people that they run into. There may be one person that God wants you to share the gospel with, with words, with your life, with your deeds. As Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When Paul was sent to prison, this verse was in practice. God was transforming Paul's circumstances. One of the questions, though, that kind of popped into my mind, and I thought, here we go. I've dealt with this myself, is have you ever wanted to preach the gospel, but you were afraid I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, right? It's, it's scary sometimes to witness for Jesus. It's scary sometimes to not only just be a witness for the Lord, not even use words or the word of God, right? I mean, you, you might get scared. Well, I'm a Christian. I want to downplay that when I'm over here with this group, you know, because they might kick me out of this group or something, right? Everyone deals with it at certain times. Maybe the Lord has allowed you to overcome that. Great. But even seasoned evangelists, still struggle with this. I, I was watching an interview with Ray Comfort, a man who has a, a worldwide ministry, and he even said that he still has, the enemy still brings fear from time to time to try to stop him from sharing the gospel, but he stays 
true and does it. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 9 states that while Paul was in persecution, he was afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Under extreme persecution, even in prison, we can trust that God will not let us down. We can proclaim the gospel fearlessly like Paul. You're probably thinking, well, that's good, you know, I'll, I'll trust God and I'll proclaim the gospel, but, you know, I'm going to do it with the right motives, okay? Because the only time I serve the Lord is with the right motives. And that leads us to our second way of sharing the gospel unceasingly. It is to proclaim the gospel unceasingly, obediently, regardless of motive. How many times have you been held back with like, well, I'm going to serve the Lord, but I'm kind of not feeling it, or I'm, maybe I'm not doing it with the right attitude, or I, I, I am jealous or envious, and you hesitate, or you don't put 100% in, or you say, I'll wait till the next time. We are to proclaim the gospel unceasingly, obediently, regardless of motive. See, Paul was dealing with two primary groups of preachers in here. There were those who were selfish and envious, and those that did it out of goodwill. As 15 to 17 says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Paul is saying that some people will preach the gospel with good motives and some with bad motives. That's going to happen no matter what you do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've seen some evangelists who are asking for $1,000 online or on, on television. Just call this number right now and you'll get like spiritual seed flower money. That's going to let you sprout money in your backyard from Jesus. That motive, probably not good. Just going to throw that out there. Now, I'm not saying that you, you can't compensate. Of course, we need money to do things and you need financial support. But I've seen some people just even recently like selling coins and stuff and you pray with them. I'm like, what does that do with anything? That's the wrong motive. But Paul is saying there's always going to be someone who does it with the wrong motive. There's always going to be someone who does it with the right motive. Again, New Testament scholar Dr. Keener says this. He says, despite the disapproval of some philosophers, competition for honor was a central value for men in much of the society in the first century, including Rome and its colonies. But Jewish teachers allowed that serving God from impure motives was better than not serving him at all. Think about that for a second, because sometimes we can get hung up on the fact, well, I'm not serving the Lord 100% devotion right now. I'm like at 80 right now, right? And you're like, maybe I won't do this. Or you might withdraw from something, because you're like, well, I'm feeling like there's a conflict. No, God is saying there's always going to be some people doing it. So proclaim the gospel unceasingly regardless. Paul was not advocating for selfish, envious preaching, as 1 Corinthians 13 would say, or to do things out of love. He was merely responding to, this is the way the world is. We live in the real world. There's always going to be good and bad. The question I have to ask you, though, is, have you ever served the Lord with bad motives? Have you ever served the Lord with good motives? What is more important, to obey or perfect our motives? I think you guys already know the answer. We can't perfect them on this world until we get our redeemed bodies in the Lord, until everything is made right and new. We have the Holy Spirit, but we're still dealing with the flesh. It is more important to be obedient, <clears throat> excuse me, to proclaim the gospel unceasingly. As Acts 1.8 says that we are to declare Jesus all across the world, to our cities, to our communities, to everywhere, to the very world. Proclaim the gospel unceasingly everywhere, always, in every way, which leads us to our third and final point. 
Christians, the most important thing you can do is obediently proclaim the gospel unceasingly everywhere and in every way. As verse 18 says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, regardless of motive, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. The most important thing is not our motives, is not our circumstances, is not even our attitude, although that is important. It's the fact that God will sovereignly use our obedience to proclaim the gospel as long as we are obediently doing it. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, you know, I, I kind of proclaim the gospel. I might want to do that. What I'm saying is God is telling us to let our lives proclaim the gospel and be obedient to using us wherever we go. Opening ourselves up to saying, this is the time to share the word of God. This is the time to pray for someone. To making sure that our character and our lives are marked by holiness. To love our neighbors as God has called us to love one another. To share Jesus in every way possible. A good example of this is how politicians campaign for office. Last year we had the, the presidential election, right? And regardless of candidate or who you voted for or didn't vote for, you know what they did? Those candidates and their staffs and their crews, they went out day after day and pushed their message and pushed their message and pushed their message in every single way possible because they had important news that they wanted the world to hear. Now, whether you agreed with that or their motives, which was not always pure, we can learn something from those campaigns. It's that their motives were not always good, but they proclaimed the message unceasingly. If politicians and presidents, presidential candidates and senators can go out there and do that, how much more are we to bring the life-saving good news of Jesus Christ to the world? As verse 18 says, we are to proclaim the gospel unceasingly, always, and in every way. Are you making an effort to be obedient to proclaim the gospel? Are you preaching Christ at your workplace, at your school, on Facebook, on Instagram, when you visit, if you're one of those uh, newer, more tech-savvy, on TikTok? I mean, I don't even like TikTok. I feel like an old person now. I'm like, get, the, get off my lawn and take TikTok with you. All believers in Christ can proclaim the gospel unceasingly by being obedient and looking to make Christ known in their circumstances, wherever they're at, with whatever group they're with. What God truly wants from each saint, each preacher, each believer is us to faithfully proclaim the gospel. It's just to do it. It doesn't have to always be the same. You don't always have to share a presentation. But God does want us to use words. I've always taken, I've always taken a little bit of umbrage with that St. Francis of Assisi quote where it says, you know, share the gospel, but if necessary, use words. No, use words. You don't always have to use words. God might have you in a position where it's just your life reflecting Jesus. But there's a time when the Holy Spirit's going to say, hey, go pray for that person. Hey, share this word with that person. Hey, ask them if they know Jesus. God wants us to be faithful, to be obedient, to trust his sovereignty, but to do it. So the three ways that you can proclaim the gospel is that you can proclaim the gospel in every circumstance by having a godly attitude when your faith is being persecuted for Christ or when unexpected hardship or trials cause you to find yourself in suffering circumstances. And when you do, God will powerfully bless you as you preach Christ to others. Two, you can proclaim the gospel by being obedient. Alongside fellow ministers, believers, Christians, out of love and out of goodwill, without anxiety or fear, regardless of motive, just being obedient. And three, you can proclaim the gospel unceasingly, by sharing Jesus in every way possible with your life, with your witness, with words, with the word of God, 
at church, at school, on your sports team, at the grocery store, in conversations with your neighbors. In every way possible. And God will sovereignly use it for his kingdom. So we can and we must proclaim the gospel unceasingly. In every way, everywhere, at work, school, on phone, at church, give someone a call. If they need to be social distance, socially distance, but still reach out to them. If they're okay with in person, meet with them in person. But don't pass up those opportunities. We can do this with our words, our witness, and the word in our very lives, but we must do it. The world needs this news. Thank you. I ran a little bit over today.